Hello everyone, welcome. We're gonna take this opportunity today to respond to many of the most frequent questions that we get from uh, potential residents wondering what it's like here to live in Costa Rica. Are there dangerous animals here in Costa Rica? Well, uh, the short answer is yes, and the longer answer is uh, you don't really need to be afraid of most of them. The most common threat here in Costa Rica is a snake, and it's a snake that goes by two names. Sometimes it's called a fer de lance, and other times a terciopelo. This snake does have one of the most poisonous bites here in the, in the world, but the nice thing about being in a country that is used to dealing with snake bites is, and with one of the most uh, deadliest snakes in the world, is that they're really good at managing how to uh, take care of people when they do get bitten. And so all of the hospitals here have an anti-venom serum that they give people as soon as they've been bitten by a terciopelo. And I don't mean to imply that it happens that often. Um, we've been here for about six years now, and I would say over that time, we've seen uh, two or three terciopelos on the property in that entire time. So it's not uh, something that is present for us every day, but it means you take simple measures, like if you're walking in tall grass, you know, not doing that in flip-flops and, and maybe rustling the grass, tall grass ahead of you before you uh, start walking through it. With such an abundance of, of wildlife uh, here and the amazing biodiversity, there are animals like jaguars and pumas, but they're more in the jungle, and so they're not really active uh, around the community. Are household essentials easy to find here in Costa Rica? So for the most part, they are. Uh, it's just a question of where. Um, certainly in San Jose, the capital city of Costa Rica, there are plenty of stores there that will have brands that you're familiar with. There are stores like Crate and Barrel uh, that have a lot of home furnishings. And then many of the hardware stores uh, carry brands that will be more familiar to you. I would say that the part that they might be lacking on is the highly specialized household uh, you know, appliances or things that if you're doing a lot of cooking in the kitchen and there's certain um, tools or that, that you like in the, in the kitchen there, some of those are more difficult to find, but you can order them on Amazon and in, through um, a service here called AeroPost, you can have those items delivered right here to you in Costa Rica. Is the area near Rise safe? So we've been here now for six years and so far uh, we have not had anything stolen from us. And so we feel perfectly safe. And in fact, uh, I've had things returned to me, iPhone, iPad that fell out of a ATV that I was driving along the road. And it's also not uncommon in the local uh, Facebook group here in Parazeladon for people to post about finding a wallet with money in it and wanting to return it to the owners. So being here in a beautiful mountain valley away from the tourist area offers us a greater degree of stability and safety. Uh, it is true that in the, in the touristy areas along the coast, petty theft, if you were to leave a, a phone in the, in the car unlocked, that wouldn't exactly be wise. But my experience here and that of our family and the families around here is complete safety. Opening bank accounts uh, can be challenging before you have residency, but there are plenty of ways to get around the challenge of, of doing it as an individual. The easiest way is to open up a company, either an LLC or a corporation, and to just open up uh, the bank account in the company's name to help you transact here in the country. Once you have residency, opening up a bank account is super easy to do on an individual level, but uh, that process for residency can, can take uh, a year or, or 18 months. So in, during that time, it makes more sense to open up a company account, which uh, can be done for uh, a few hundred dollars to, to create the company. As part of our relocation program, we also help to not only answer these questions, but assist people in opening up uh, accounts like bank accounts. It's, it can be a process that's unfamiliar to people, but we can recommend uh, lawyers to open up uh, the company. And then just in terms of the paperwork and which banks to open up accounts at, 
I have accounts at five different banks here in Costa Rica. And that's not because I need five different banks. It was because I wanted to try out all the different ones and the service levels. And I certainly have some guidance for, for people uh, on which to open up that are best for business, which for an individual, which bank to use if you're going to do a lot of inter international transactions. So I've learned through experience which ones are good for expats. And, and for me, coming from the United States, um, there's a certain level of uh, efficiency um, that, that I'm used to um, in terms of banking. And some of the banks here in Costa Rica offer that. Others do not. And so uh, we can help guide you to which banks to go to and which will be best for you. I often get the question about whether people should pack up their entire household and ship it by container or let it all go and come here and just uh, downsize and, and buy less things for their life here. And that's a, it's a difficult question to answer um, without knowing each person's personal attachments and priorities. Uh, some, like ourselves, we did bring a container down. We brought some of our belongings, but we also took that opportunity to bring a car, an ATV, and some other uh, items that we thought might be more difficult to find here in, in Costa Rica in the brands that we wanted. But other families have chosen to, to sell all that and let it go and then start over here with just acquiring a um, less amount of things and that that has been a path for them. You can expect the cost of, of bringing stuff in a container to vary from ten to twenty thousand um, dollars once you've gotten the container and then paid uh, whatever minimal taxes uh, would be there would be on your personal belongings. Um, there are um, high import duties on cars, but there is a new program that uh, Costa Rica is implementing where those import duties can be eliminated. Um, this is another area of the relocation program where we help people to navigate. How do people use their cell phones here, given that they have numbers coming from their home country and but also want a, a number here in the new country? And the best and way that, that people can do that is to have a phone that has dual SIM cards. And most all of the, the modern phones today do, certainly all of the Apple phones. And so you definitely want to get a phone that has two SIM cards because then you can keep your uh, United States or European number while also adding in your Costa Rica number. And by having that Costa Rica number, all of your data that you'll use here to surf the internet and GPS and email and all of those functions um, will be at a fraction of the cost. So you're certainly want to, going to want to get a local plan. And there's a number of companies here in Costa Rica from Claro to Liberty to Colby um, that you can sign up for. And certainly in our region, the, the best uh, cell phone company to sign up for is Claro. There's the, the most towers around here. Starting a company here in Costa Rica is, is very easy. And you can do that for a few hundred dollars and just engage a lawyer to, to help you through that process. One of the big decisions that you'll make about that is do you set up an LLC or do you set up a corporation? And one of the big differences between the two, particularly as it relates to US citizens, is that an LLC is a pass-through entity for tax purposes. So if you set that company up, um, what happens here in Costa Rica within that LLC will flow through to your individual tax return. On the other side, the corporation is a closed entity for tax purposes. And so what happens there in Costa Rica stays in Costa Rica. There's some other differences between the two, um, but that is one of the primary differences that, that you'll want to keep in mind when you're deciding which company to set up. But either of them are, are very easy to set up and you could set them up uh, simply to be the entity that you transact and, and operate in here while you're going through residency. And then you could dissolve that company uh, when, when you wish. One of the things that that will give you the advantage to do is to pay, is to open up a bank account where you can then pay people um, electronically. And that's very common here in Costa Rica to pay people by bank transfer or uh, a system called Simpe, which is, which is very uh, similar to the Zelle system in the United States, where you can pay by phone, pay somebody just knowing their phone number or email. 
So we get a lot of questions about residency and what are, what are the different pathways to gaining residency here, and also about the nom digital nomad visa, which was recently introduced in the, in the last year. So there are a couple of ways to get residency. They all take um, from anywhere from 12 to 18 months, but during that process, you don't actually have to leave the country every 90 days that you would if you were under a tourist visa. So just filing the paperwork allows you to stay for a lengthy period of time while you're going through that process. The different um, visa, uh, residency visa types you can get, uh, there's one that you get, uh, which is an investment visa, which you need to invest currently uh, $200,000 into Costa Rica, and then you will be able to, to get that visa. They're currently lowering that down to $150,000. So in the future, that, that number will actually be even lower. Uh, another way to um, get a by depositing $60,000 into a, a Costa Rican bank account and then you just draw down uh, $2,500 uh, to yourself each month so that you can show that you're able to support yourself if you, um, while you're living here in Costa Rica. And the last way is to demonstrate that you have $2,500 a month or more in income. Uh, ideally, that would be through a W-2, but there is a pathway for just demonstrating a, a financial profile that shows that you have that level of income. And as you can imagine, Costa Rica is really just trying to make sure that if you're here, you're able to support yourself. And so if you're able to de demonstrate that capacity, then the path to getting a, resi a residency here is rather easy. This is another area where we can assist in the relocation program as well. Uh, there's lawyers, immigration lawyers that we work with here in Costa Rica that can help guide you through that process so that you don't have to do it alone. And lastly, I want to talk about uh, something called the Digital Nomad Visa, which was recently introduced here in Costa Rica. That visa allows you to stay in, in Costa Rica for a year without having to leave the country. And it also allows you to extend that for another year. And the uh, residency requirements for that visa are more streamlined and, than the full residential, residency visa process that you would go through that I just described. So that's another pathway that could be uh, implemented by those that are coming here. One of some of the biggest surprises for when you come to Costa Rica, and one of the ones that I often convey about is the car, buying a car here in Costa Rica. First off, because there are high import duties for cars that are brought into this country, cars in general here are very expensive and even used cars are expensive. The plus to that is that any car that you do purchase tends to hold on to its value, but you can expect the price for vehicles here to be about 30 to 40, maybe even 50% higher than what you would expect into the in the United States or maybe in Europe. So it's a really important decision um, about wh what car you're gonna buy here and, and what you can afford. And the, the, what I tell most people is the car you wanna buy here is the car that can get repaired here. So some people are think, well, I'll just import my car because I already own it. And that may work really well in this environment, but what happens if it's a brand that is not supported here in Costa Rica? you're gonna have a long lead time to getting parts and the mechanics that are here are not gonna be super familiar with working on uh, one of those cars. So my suggestion to people is to, when they get here, is to buy one of the major brands. And by that, I mean Toyota, Mitsubishi, uh, Ford, they even have Jeep here. So buying one of the major brands will make your life a lot easier as you go through the ownership process of, of, of owning that car. To add a little more um, insight into whether you should bring a car or buy one here, um, we did both. So we bought a car here, we bought a Mitsubishi, and like I said, to, to buy a car that, that could be serviced here. And we also brought one. Right before we left, I bought an old Jeep Wrangler, a 20-year-old Jeep. And that's a very simple car to work on and easy to get parts. And if I needed to get uh, worked on here, I could have that as well. But like I said, when you import a car, 
at least right now, there are serious import duties that you have to pay. And to give you an example, I bought that car for about $8,500 in the United States, and the import duties for that car were $4,500. And that doesn't even count the transportation cost of, of you know, when I put it into the container. So there's a, they don't exactly go by the blue book value. They have their own uh, formula for what they consider to be the value of the car. So you can expect to pay some significant import duties. Now, that car will retain a lot of value here in Costa Rica. And in fact, you may even be able to sell it for more than, than what you paid for, including the, the transportation and import duties. But it's just something to know up front that you're going to need to outlay that cash uh, ahead of time. Another question that we get a lot from people is, is healthcare. What, are, what can they expect in terms of medical support here in Costa Rica? So for us and our family, we moved here right at the beginning of COVID. And so just to be absolutely safe, we got a insurance policy here in Costa Rica that also covered us in the United States. We didn't really need to get that. And so the cost for, for that health insurance policy was about $550 per month and included coverage for our entire family, myself, my wife, and our seven-year-old daughter. If I did not include the component that covered us in the United States, the cost of that insurance would have been closer to $200 a month to cover our family here in Costa Rica. And so just to get a sense of that there are significantly lower insurance costs uh, to have a private insurance policy here in Costa Rica. Additionally, once you get residency, you can opt into the public health policy uh, for, that's offered to all residents and citizens. And that is uh, significantly less expensive. I'm also in that policy, and currently that is a around a little over $100 a month. So you have multiple options there in terms of how you would like to insure your family. What I also tell people, though, is there's going to be a change in perspective about the cost of medical services here. You can go to the hospital and if you want to get an ultrasound or, you know, your child uh, has a fractured arm or something like that, you can go in there and have that um, taken care of and supported at a private hospital for a fraction of the cost that that would cost in the United States. To give you an example, one of the families that recently moved here and is in the community, uh, their son fell down and did actually fracture his arm. They went to the private hospital. They were in and out for 200, or for in two and a half hours at a total cost of $150 with the cast and everything. So I know in, in at least the United States, that would tend to cost a lot more. And so all of these services really cost a fraction of what they would in the United States. And uh, I find myself sometimes, uh, if I want that, whether it's blood work, I just don't even go to the insurance policy. I just pay it myself because it's, it's such an insignificant expense. What's it like to live here in Costa Rica if you don't speak Spanish? So we're a great example. Um, my wife does not speak really any Spanish and I only speak a little. I'm learning, uh, but it it's actually makes it more difficult that we have a wonderful team here that speaks both English and, Sp and Spanish. So I'm not forced to use Spanish as, as often as I, as I might. But there are plenty of people here that hardly speak any Spanish and it's not as difficult as you might think. Um, particularly in this valley, there are a lot of uh, people who speak at least a little bit of English here. So when you go into stores, you can certainly get by there. And in this digital age, having Google Translate or, or Apple Translate or any, any translation program certainly helps uh, because there's, there's coverage everywhere. So you're not going to be left with, with a, a lack of a way to communicate with people. If you really need to, you can just use one of the Translate programs. That being said, it's on my um, list in 2023 to significantly advance my Spanish because I would like to just use it as a tool to be able to connect more with the local community. What are the challenges that you might encounter here living in Costa Rica? I get this question a lot and I put a lot of thought into it. And 
One of the biggest challenges, I think, and our, our sales director actually expresses this perfectly. She says, you cannot selectively apply Pura Vida in life here in Costa Rica. And for those of you that don't know, the lifestyle here in Costa Rica is called Pura Vida, and that means pure life. And there is a, there's a casualness, a relaxation that, that comes along with that that feels really amazing when you're living here. But that also tends to permeate some of the businesses or particularly government institutions. And so there's a lack of a sense of urgency sometimes or a lack of efficiency in terms of how things operate. And so there is a part of you that will need to surrender and be patient with that. And I feel like that's a culturally, that's a really, that was a challenge for me. And especially coming from the United States where there's this, there's an intensity and a competitiveness that drives efficiency everywhere in society. And so you become accustomed to that. And then in the absence of that, there can be like a level of frustration or lack of attention to detail that, that, feels, that feels unfamiliar and potentially upsetting. But you need to look at that in the context of the entire life that you're having here. And sometimes I use the joke sometimes with my wife when I tell her, um, sweetie, I'm, I'm going to the bank today. And she just looks at me and she says, good luck. And what she really means by that and what I know is I may go to the bank today, especially a particular one, spend two or three hours there and actually not get done what I really need to get done. And I'll have to come back again. And so that doesn't happen as often as, as you know, I may be suggesting, but when it does, it feels really uh, frustrating at the moment. But overall, I would say that's one of the biggest adjustments is just relaxing into the life here and letting go of it being done exactly the way that, that you did before. I want to speak to another one that comes up for people, and that's in terms of access to things that they want. We become so accustomed to Amazon Prime, where in the United States, where you instantly can have something usually the day of or definitely within two days. Here, it might take you a little bit longer uh, to have those things. It reminds me of when I was when I was younger, where when you live in a local community, you had to learn who had what. It wasn't like there was like one store that had everything, you know, or Home Depot or, uh, and so you just had to learn where to find the things that you need. But what comes with that is also like a, a really nice local touch. You actually get to know the business owners here and they'll give you, you know, when they say, here's the number for the business, you may actually be talking to the person who owns the business when you send a WhatsApp message or, or call them up. And that personal level of attention um, feels good, but it takes time to establish. How to transition into the Pura Vida lifestyle. And my response to that is, your environment here will help you a lot with that. I first noticed that years ago when I came here, some of the habits and things that I was used to doing in the United States every day, I would forget to do here in Costa Rica. Just being surrounded in this environment, in this natural wonderland has a calming effect on you. And you don't really even notice it working, but your system starts to slow down. Like the some of the urgency and the anxiety um, that you might be experiencing starts to melt out of you. And the more you're in that environment, the more your system just starts to adjust and adjust and adjust. And you're talking to somebody who grew up in and around New York City, lived in New York City. Now, when I go there, that's what feels unfamiliar and abnormal to me, like the intensity, the noise, the busyness, the, the disconnection. And that didn't happen instantly, but it happens consistently here over time. And so I wouldn't say there's any pressure that you need to put on yourself about it. Just allow the environment and your human experience of what life is like here to take care of that for you. How does living in a community add to my quality of life? If you had asked me this a few years ago when we were living in Encinitas, California, I would have said, hey, we live in a community and it's great and we love it. And it's true. But the reality is even living in that community, 
we didn't really see people very often. The people that we were friends with, we didn't spend as much time together as you might think. And here, it's totally opposite. I don't know if it's because we live so close to each other now, or our kids are you know, super connected because of the school, but we do not only things you know, on a daily basis together, but when the special occasions like Christmas that's coming up, we did Thanksgiving, we do all these things as a community and we are in each other's lives on a daily basis. Um, and that feels incredibly supportive to know that if my wife and I need to go somewhere together and that a place that Kira may not want to go, maybe she finds it boring. On a moment's notice that we can call people who live, hey, can Kira come over and play? Or, um, and it's just really simple and easy. So living in community to me means having the support that you need to navigate life in a more easeful way. And I've often said that that's what we're offering here is ease and choice for families so that they can live the lifestyle they want. And community is one of the components that allows for that choice. And so it's, a, it's something that we thought we had when we were living in California, but we didn't realize the extent to which you can have it until we had this experience here with the community and families that have moved here. What are the health benefits of living in nature? Well, I can only speak for myself. I'm sure that you could Google it and there'd be all kinds of answers for why living in nature is great for our physical bodies, our emotional bodies, our spiritual bodies. For me, living in nature is just a constant reminder that to not take life so seriously. Like there is an entire world that you're surrounded by, a entire ecosystem of living species navigating their journey in, in life. And so for me, it's just a, a soft, subtle reminder that human beings are just one piece of the puzzle. Our experience here is, is a, just a tiny speck in the, um, the realm of the entire universe. And so nature is a reminder and it's a reminder to me, someone who's often been in a rush or a high sense of urgency, to just slow down. You're surrounded by natural beings that are, that are doing their thing in a very slow way. There's no need to be in a rush in anything. And so that's how it's affected me. I also just like it because I get to do these things with my daughter in nature. We often take ATV rides or go bike riding or hiking together. And all of it, all of our play is outdoors. We're breathing this air, feeling the warmth and the coolness, the humidity and the dryness, all of these things just physically in our, in our bodies. And then the, the incredible aesthetic beauty of the different colored plants and trees and the birds, whatever they are, whether they're toucans or parakeets or aracaris, like all of this is, is your environment. It's where you live. And to be surrounded by that every day and to wake up every day and look out over that is, is really humbling and really warming to, to your soul. What's it like to raise children in Costa Rica? So we have a seven-year-old daughter, Kira, and it's been a, just a dream and a treat to raise her in this environment. I think I've expressed this before when I, when I asked her just a couple of years ago how she enjoyed living here in Costa Rica compared to, to California. And she said, this is where I live. This is my home. This is where I belong. And that just filled me with such incredible warmth to hear that from our daughter who had a wonderful life that she really enjoyed in California and to come here and feel that level of joy and belonging here in this environment. So it reminds me a little bit, I guess, of my own upbringing where we ran free um, in nature, discovered new things, explored, connected with the other living species that are, that are around us. And so, as I've mentioned before, this idea that our children's play is outside, 
They're not on screens. They're not watching movies or looking at phones or doing apps. They are outside creating. And when you put children in this environment, the things they can do with a dead leaf, a twig, a flower, and a blade of grass, and how they see the world and combine those into some exquisite <laughs> sculpture uh, and, and hear them tell you what they're creating, it's just, it leaves you so joyful as a parent. And it's also a way for, for us as parents to spend time together. We gather, whether it's here at Kinkara or other places, and just let the kids roam free. And we're, and we're there sitting around talking, discussing life and, you know, more adult topics without a care in the world for where the kids are. And that feels just really good on a family level, like a soul level, friend level. And, and that's part of the lifestyle here that is so appealing. It doesn't mean that we give up like our passions and our purposes and, um, and our work in the world, you can have all of that and still be doing it in this environment in a way that um, it feels more nourishing to your family. What is the vision for schooling here in, at RISE? It's an important element. It's probably the biggest attractor for families that are coming to live here is our vision for the school. My own journey through education started at a in Montessori, actually, at a very, very young age, and then transitioned to this second oldest Waldorf school in the country at Kimberton Waldorf School. And I really feel uh, connected to that style of learning. And that style of learning emphasizes creativity. Um, it emphasizes collaboration over competition. And they don't just teach skills, they're growing children's capacity. And so creating a structure and a framework for our children to thrive in that environment and to hold open the innate imagination and creative talents that they have for as long as, as we can feels like a path for setting our, our children up for success in the world. And so we've adopted that model uh, for the children here at RISE. So we started the school in July, 2021, um, we have a design for the for the new facility that we will that is part of the infrastructure budget um, for the whole community. So it's not a this will come later. It's this will be here now when we do all the construction and build people's homes. That's when the school will be built as well. So the school I often refer to as the heartbeat of the community because it, it is that for us. Um, we gather around school functions. Um, our relationships and bonds are formed uh, oftentimes through the relationships that our children have with each other. And so the schooling element is, is critical to the path um, and uh, of the community as a whole. As some of you may know, this valley is an agricultural valley and it gets abundant water that drives the amazing opportunities to grow year round. And so it shouldn't come as any surprise that we have an enormous farmer's market here, probably the size of two or three football fields if you're from the United States, with literally every exotic fruit or vegetable or anything you could possibly want that is grown here. So that farmer's market is once a week um, on, on Thursdays. And so it's also a social gathering. So we go there every week and buy all the fruits and vegetables that we need for that week. It's not that those aren't um, available in local supermarkets, but we like to support the, the local farmers and to get the most fresh product that they have out there. So you're not gonna find any shortage of farmer's market op opportunities here in Pera Zeladon. How do you get to rise in, here in Pera Zeladon? There's a, a number of ways. Um, there's the short way and the scenic way. And so the scenic way is that you can drive here from the capital of San Jose. It's about a three and a half hour drive uh, through a road that it's called the Cerro de la Muerte, which goes through the mountains of, of Costa Rica into our mountain valley. There's another path that you can take along the coast. It takes about a half hour longer but also is a beautiful drive along the coast before you get into our mountain valley. 
The roads are paved. Um, it's uh, they're well traveled uh, in in both directions, so there's nothing to worry about in terms of the, a, a long drive like that. An even more fun way to arrive to Rise is to fly here. As you know, we have our own airstrip, and so you can fly directly from San Jose onto the Rise property, and it takes about 25 minutes. We have access to multiple size planes and a wonderful pilot, and so that's a really enjoyable and exciting way to arrive here. You get to fly over the beautiful mountains and there are scenic waterfalls along the way. So it's a, another option for people who would like to get here even faster. So being so close to San Isidro del General, you have access to things like um, large hardware stores and lawyers and accountants and DHL or Aeropost, or there's even a Walmart there. And so some of the things that you need just for daily living uh, that support your lifestyle here are within 20 minutes. And so that is nice to have a, an urban center and one that is actually growing rapidly. There's, there's other large retailers that are coming into, into the San Isidro area. And so that only helps support your lifestyle here uh, by providing the things that you need that um, the earth isn't providing directly or, or that are right here in Santa Elena. You can go into town and take care of those things. Is there an application process in order to be a part of the RISE community? Actually, we don't do it through application. I get this question often, and my response to them is that we're not gonna exclude, we're gonna attract. And so far, that has worked fantastically. Some of the elements that are um, most common in, in, life, in the lifestyle here at RISE tend to attract a certain type of family. And so uh, by putting in those elements, we're naturally I wouldn't say filtering out those that it does not appeal to and attracting those that it does. And so some of those might be things like the Waldorf School. Uh, Waldorf is not a mainstream educational model. So we tend to attract families that are interested in alternative education. And those families um, sometimes tend to be more adventurous and want to live outside uh, their, their home country. And so with some of the components here, in place, they tend to attract certain types of community members. And so we've been leaning into and, and relying on that as a way to build the, the community and to set the course for the community. How can you become a member of the RISE community? So the first step, if you feel connected to what we're sharing with you today or what you've read about RISE, you can contact our sales team through the website at risecostarica.com and fill out the form and our sales team will be in contact with you uh, right away and start to answer any of the other questions that you have or schedule a visit for you to stay here at RISE. <music>